Hey everyone, I'm Brianna from Boom and welcome to the first Boom Chat of 2021. We did it. All right. So today I have the honor of speaking with Connor McCreary and Vivi Glass, the phenomenal team that's bringing you The Last Witch. On the day of an annual festival, young Sersha finds herself deeper in the woods than she's ever been despite her father's warnings. Soon after a surprising discovery, a terrible tragedy forces her on the run. Traveling with her mysterious Nan and her younger brother Brom, she soon discovers that the blue-black birthmark across her shoulder that's always made her an object of teasing is far more powerful than she knew. All right, Connor, where did you get the inspiration for this story? I know I'm not familiar with a lot of Celtic folklore, but I'm so intrigued and I want to learn more. Where, where did this come from and what research did you do for it? Oh, well, first of all, thanks so much for, that's an amazing summary of the story, much better than I have. So I've actually copied and pasted that into a file so I can now use this in the future. Um, I think exceptionally well done. Uh, for those of you, I guess people out there, you may be able to tell by the, the name and the shock of unruly hair, most of it below the equator, um, that I am of Irish descent. Uh, actually, my dad was born in Dublin, and so I was raised kind of with Irish fairy tales, Celtic mythology. And uh, what I've always loved about Celtic mythology is it's <laughs> it's really, it's, it's dark, it's scary, right? Like Celtic fairy tales often involve the heroes losing or paying this horrible price for uh, what they, you know, what they are trying to accomplish. Uh, and so search actually came into my mind maybe a decade ago, a friend of mine was doing a, uh, had started a small publication and he was doing something for charity. And he said, hey, I just done Kill Shakespeare. And he was like, I really like Kill Shakespeare. Would you do something for me? And I said, well, I don't think I have time. I'm, I, I'm not an artist. I, I don't have time to, to find one to do a comic, but maybe I could write you a short story. And that's kind of where Sersha came. It was right around, um, uh, I guess it was around Groundhog Day, which in Ireland, has a different day, it's this Feast of Imbolc. And it's the idea in there, it's not a groundhog who comes out and checks out their shadow, it's this witch. And if the witch comes out and she can see her shadow, it means it's sunny. And it's sunny because she's collecting firewood so that she'll have enough to get through the next few weeks of winter and presumably to cook and eat children. So <laughs> it's, and if it's not sunny, then it's okay. So if it's a sunny day on this Feast of Imbolc, you don't go outside. And so it just came into my mind about this young girl who decided that she wanted to go outside, that she wanted to prove something to somebody about how brave she was and that she was going to go on this adventure deep into the woods to find, you know, this castle that was supposed to be there that she was sure was abandoned, but to prove to everybody how brave she was. And that's kind of where it started. And then a few years ago, I was talking with the people at Boom and they said, did you have anything in mind? And I said, I have this strange story about this, this 12 year old little girl who wants to find, who wants to prove how, how, brave she is and ends up finding a witch and it all kind of just blossomed from there and then V got involved and turned it into something on a whole other level so yeah that's where it all began well that's amazing and thank you for leading me into my next question for V how did you create these amazing character designs mm. um so first we kind of talked I talked aesthetic with Connor and what kind of texts and like vibes would influence the look of the uh, the world but specifically like the character designs and we we're working on a lot of stuff like um the dark crystal came up a lot and sort of that more 80s jim henson look that it's it's a dark fairy tale so obviously that's visually um mm -hmm. influencing it uh, and then i took the the key concepts that we've taken from that like the the darkness a reasonable amount of historical influence um that fairy tale vibe and uh, iterated on those uh quite a lot so, so I was trying to convey a big one big sort of core concept per character like um, Saoirse's frustration and her growing power um, and Bram's energy and his his contrast with his, his sort of bright bubbly smiley personality by contrast to his sister um, and Nan's kind of combination of being very out there and slightly imposing but also very caring <laughs> Um, uh, and yeah, just trying to trying to boil down all of those into um, a, a design that would uh, let you get that idea the first time you see them, uh, ideally. Um, and then just kind of the the last stage of that process, I guess, was just working on um, variety over the whole 
cast, not just the main mm -hmm. three. Um, in terms of we wanted a, a variety of silhouette. So obviously there's the sort of different shapes and sizes of the, the main cast um, and uh, a variety of expression, a variety of color palette so that things don't all blend in together. Um, when you're working on something that is ostensibly set, it, I'm, I was gonna say ostensibly set in the early medieval period. It's not really tied to a specific historical time period, but you know, it's, uh, it's that like, what you think of as the generic fairy tale time. There's a uh, temptation to make everything really brown and mm -hmm. sort of shroud everyone <laughs> in like just like brown uh, fabric and I wanted to avoid that. So a variety of color palette, a variety of expression uh, and a variety of uh, the type of person in that uh, we uh, we wanted to add in uh, as much diversity as possible, you know. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I when I looked at the first issue, I was just like, oh my gosh, all of these characters are so individualistic. Like you can like you can't mistake anybody for anybody else, but they're just but they all work together so well. And I'm so excited to see the rest of it. Um, and so speaking of the characters and the designs, um, Sersha also has this design on her shoulder. And so Connor, I wanted to ask you, can you give us a hint as to the meaning behind this birthmark maybe? Ah, the, 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 the witch mark. Um, it is a, it's a hugely important part of the story. Uh, actually, the, the working title for this project was Witch Mark originally. Uh, and then we found out that there was a series of YA books that had come out recently that were also called Witch Mark. And so that went out the window. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the idea was, you know, uh, you know, it's it's a classic trope, I think, of the genre of having some sort of physical marking for a hero or a villain, something that, you know, that really represents kind of who they are, or what they're going to become. And so this, without, you know, giving too much away, um, Nan has always told Sersha that this strange mark that she has meant that she was marked for greatness that this was what identified her granddaughter as something special. Mm -hmm. And Saoirse has always really taken this to heart. She, you know, her mother has passed, uh, you know, historically we're, we're after one of the Irish famines of which every kind of knows the great famine, but there were several. Mm -hmm. And so we were kind of pierced in that little piece of history. So her mom has passed, her, her and her father live on the outskirts of the village, even in this poor village, they're not very wealthy. Um, you know, her father is basically like a woodcutter. Uh, Nan is this strange old lady who lives even off into the woods. So they're already like the weirdos who've got the even weirder grandmother. And so she's always kind of been, she's an outcast in this tiny little village, you know, and part of her's always thought to herself, well, you know, my grandmother's just saying something nice to me, right? Like I get mm -hmm. it. I'm, I'm old enough now to know that the weird kind of gross blotchy stuff on my shoulder, that's, that's, that's not a mark that says I'm special. It's, it's just another reason why I'm weird and an outcast. But still, it's your grandmother and you want to believe it. And so she's always kind of held on this hope that there is something about this mark that it's that is true, that it does mean something about who she is and what she's going to be. And it's kind of fueled her. She, you know, she is fueled by a lot of frustration and a lot of loss and a lot of anger over, you know, how little she's had in her life. Uh, and so going forward, that mark, it it is a mark of making her special but it's it's more than that and it's more than that in a lot of ways that i you know that search is going to have to really face that are not good and there is this notion of you know when you when you think of yourself as special it also means you're kind of putting yourself apart from the rest of the people around you from the rest of humanity even and so that is a double-edged sword we all do want to be special but you have to look at how you, you know, when you think you're special, how do you treat the people around you? And how do you let that quote unquote special nature inform what kind of person you are? Um, you know, this, you know, we weren't writing some direct parallel of like the 1% and the 99, but there is a bit of that of like, hey, when you, when you think that you're up here and everybody else is down here, well, are you just walking on their heads the whole time? And that's, mm -hmm. that's a big chunk that Sersha is going to have to deal with. Oh, I'm so interested to see how that happens. Um, okay, so V, with this very important mark, how did you come up with a design for it? Like what aspects did you look at? Um, yeah, I'm just gonna let you talk. How'd you come up with the design? <laughs> it's, uh, it is a uh, modified Celtic knot, which is a no brainer. 
considering the subject matter of this story. Um, so it's a, a very, very simplified um, Celtic knock, because obviously they're incredibly complex designs, mm -hmm. which I didn't want to have to draw over and over again for one. Um, but also that's not something that even a magical little girl is going to have, you know, naturally occurring on her shoulder. Um, and it's basically as simple as that. If, if that, that was the idea was something that would be reasonably, um, I guess striking is the word, something that would be memorable. Um, and also <laughs> something that the, the type of not, the type of design is not something that um, people would associate with a meaning normally already because you know sometimes mm -hmm. when people get the tattoos of knots they, they have a meaning assigned to them you didn't want to go for one of those um, because it is something that is supposed to as Carla was saying um, have a very specific uh, meaning for Sersha's life. That's awesome I love it um, it I was looking at it and I was like oh my gosh how because I know because as you said some knots actually have specific meanings and I was just like I wonder what they did to like come up with what this looks like. So that's really interesting to me because I, I used to be into Celtic culture when I was a kid. And so I was just all about like clotter rings and knots and everything. And so that I was just super into it. So I, I really love getting to see all of this on the page. Um, all right, completely pivoting. Connor, uh, this comic has the most amazing cigar smoking granny and like, I want to be best friends with her. Um, <laughs> is she based on anyone you know? Like, where did she, where did she come from? Uh, Roll Doll. Roll wow. Doll. Wow. Um, came from Roll Doll. So I was, uh, I can't remember when I was reading The Witches to my kids. So I've got two children there, five and three actually. Sorry, Pierce, uh, he's new. Um, so three, seven and five and a newborn. Um, but my eldest Peregrine and my, my son Lachlan, they love, you know, they love storytelling, right? And I, you know, their, their mother's a storyteller as well. And so we were reading The Witches and in The Witches, the grandmother is from Norway and she smokes these big black cigars and they're super smelly. And, you know, the, her little boy is kind of like, or her grandson is sort of like loves them, but kind of hates them. And so, yeah, I just, I like that idea. There's something about that I thought was really cool. Um, I liked it because I, I feel like, you know, there's this woman on the road and she's really, Nan is really the one who kind of, you know, she's, she's the Obi-Wan of this story. Uh, and that she is, you know, she is the one who's going to be teaching Sersha about the powers that she is going to be facing and, and, and possessing. Um, and Nan has some experience with that, that we kind of learn about without giving too much away. Um, so I, I, I like this idea of, yeah, this brash old lady who smokes a cigar. And I mean, she lives in the woods. She's a total outcast. Everybody in the village thinks she's, you know, at, at best a lunatic and at worst some sort of dangerous, evil, you know, like witch, I guess, right? Hiding, you know, na ha ha ha. Um, but there's also, uh, the one thing I will say is the, the cigar does serve an actual purpose in the story. So it's, it's an Ooh. affectation for sure, but there is something very important about it. Uh, so that's oh, a little, I guess, that's, Easter egg for readers to go diving into. That's exciting. Okay, that's really awesome. Because like my goal in life is to be like that creepy lady on the block that people are like sort of afraid of, but also like inspired by like, maybe she's a witch, but I'm not sure. And like, that's just like, I saw Nan and I was like, this is who I want to be when I'm older. <laughs> it's just like, I just want to be this creepy old, like this woman who is just like super strong, smokes the cigars, like, I don't care. But you know, that's, I like that. I love that we're getting a lot of these like strong characters for people to look up to. So I'm, I'm loving all of this. Okay. So V, what research on other than the knots um, on Celtic culture or costuming or imagery did you do for this book? Mm. Um, originally, loads, and then uh, I threw most of it out. So <laughs> originally, I had the visually the idea I had of how this was going to look was a much more I get but historically accurate broadly, um, and then that turned out to, as I was saying before, make it look kind kind of more boring than it should have, considering the, the audience that it's meant to be for and the fact that it's a fairy tale and it's meant to be fun to read and look at. Um, so I had, I, I think, I think this, 
I still do have in fact like a hundred reference images of like <laughs> pre-medieval Irish houses and villages and how all the landscape looked and the technology and then um, I took the parts of that that looked that looked good that looked fun to look at uh, and kept those and then added in some more fantasy elements and more ahistorical elements um, so say uh, in terms of the costume, like uh, Saoirse's dress and Nan's like cloak and dress combination are a standard Celtic and I think Viking type of dress where you have the dress and then you have straps that come over the top of the shoulder and they're held with these big beautiful brooches uh, that sometimes have big strings of beads going out round, uh, sorry, going through the middle. Um, and that's what Nan and Saoirse are wearing. Um, but then Nan's also got these big hobnail boots that didn't exist back then, more of a Victorian thing, I think, I'm not sure. Um, and, uh, you know, she's, um... nope, sorry, the other thing I was going to say is a spoiler, I think, so I can't say that. <laughs> All right, let's not do that. <laughs> the... well, just, just in time, don't worry, I'll be good. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it is within a, a certain limit, um, a, a like slightly more fantastic, a slightly more fun version of the time period it's meant to be set in. Um, and mm, I think really most of what I kept in terms of the research was the, or the landscapes or the geography or the, the stuff that would help to convey a sense of atmosphere. I love that. I literally love that you did all of this research and you were like, Nope, throwing it all out. I'm just gonna yeah. do what works. And it and it works. It's beautiful. I was like, I want to visit this place. I want to wear these costumes. I want to see people dressed up as these characters. Like it's just I can't wait to get more of this because I'm so excited for it. Now I have to jump in here for a second because I'm curious about this V now that I know all this all this research was tossed out. Podrag's mm. little cap. Like oh yeah. Is that a, like is that is Tell me that's yeah, real. Yeah, that's accurate. Oh, okay. yeah, that's okay. real. People okay. That's like this. my favorite design bit of the whole, for like, there's so much great design. I mean, again, I, I can't speak how blown away I am by, by your work, but Padraig's little like cap, it's like almost like an aviator cap. I was just like, oh my gosh, like you and Amelia Earhart one day, maybe like, we're, I'm shipping this. It's, 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 it's the next project. Oh, yay. Yay. I love it. I love it when this happens. Like we get, we get like creators together and they start talking and I love it. And just, ah, oh, I love all this. She's going back through time. She's going back to medieval Ireland. She's going to fall in love with a 12 year old. Oh, no, wait, hold on. That sounds like a horrible <laughs> idea. Mm. Connor, no! <sighs> but I, I would love uh, an Amelia Earhart story. So let's, let's put a pin in that. Yeah. Um, okay, so speaking of writing and new stories, um, Connor, what's your writing style like and how do you plan out your stories? Uh, I mean, it's changed a lot. When I first started, uh, when I was first started doing like something like Kill Shakespeare, I don't, I didn't really kind of, I kind of would just like dive into a script and I would just kind of start bashing away and I, you know, I'd have an idea of what I want to do. I, I tend to think about stuff a lot. I, I write some notes, but a lot of stuff just kind of stays in my head and it Kind of marinates until I guess it's ready. Um, I've, I've now tried to becoming a bit more disciplined about jotting thoughts down because you know I, <laughs> I'm getting older and they don't stay in here as well as they once did. Um, but working with Anthony Delcall, who's the person I did uh, Kill Shakespeare with, Anthony's like a very meticulous like beat sheet outline treatment type person and I've definitely come around much more to that way of doing things. So for it's kind of funny for, for Last Witch because I, I'd sent um, one of the editors at Boom because I've been doing the regular show Adventure Time with you guys. I got to do a little work on those, which was amazing for me. It was a great, really cool opportunity. And so I'd sent a bunch of ideas and it was funny. So I'd sent like all these like page long synopses of like eight, nine, whatever ideas I had at the time. And I included this Last Witch idea because I was like, oh yeah, that short story I wrote. But all I had was that short story, which was this girl goes in the woods and there's a witch. And like the story doesn't really go any farther than that. And I, I'm like, that's, you know, so I was just like, oh, there's this cool story girl. She goes as a witch. And I made up something about how there's this big like apocalyptic thing that comes after that. And they're like, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. Look, what are all the big apocalyptic things that come after that? And I was like, I'll send you a piece. I'll send you some notes next week. Cause I, I really <laughs> didn't know. I had no idea. I like, I, I didn't, all I knew is there's this girl. And in the original short story, when she encounters this witch, this witch like physically touches her at some point 
And that like leaves behind this mark. She didn't have it to begin with. And that was a part of like, this mark, this mark, what's the deal with this mark? Um, and so from there, I kind of started jotting down. So with, with Last Witch, what I did is that I sent an actual proper like eight or nine page where I'm like, here's all the stuff I think that happens. And then what I like to do is I like to try to beat out, and it, it's a bit different this time because originally this was going to be a graphic novel and then, you know, 2020 and COVID happened and everything changed and it became this really cool oversized single issues release. So I don't have each issue beat it out quite the same way, but I did beat out the entirety of the graphic novel. Uh, and I find that makes it way easier now. I, I spend less time when I'm writing, trying to worry about the next, I, you know, the next point or the next beat of a scene. Mm -hmm. I get to then concentrate on like, oh, how can I make this more fun, more interesting, more frightening than what I came up with on this short little sentence. And so I, I'm actually lucky. Once I get that part down, I feel like I can actually write pretty quickly. It's getting that part down. That is the, I, I'm lucky. I don't have too many days once I have the beat sheet where I'm like, Nothing got done today. I normally, if I, as long as I sit my butt down and actually start working, um, you know, I can churn through my 10, 12, 15 pages pretty easily. Um, that's but it's awesome. getting that, it's getting that skeleton down. That's the stuff that takes time and, and I wrestle with. So, you know, that's my process right now. And I'm sure it'll, you know, ask me again in a year and I'm sure it'll change again, but. Well, yeah, you gotta right keep, now. you gotta keep changing stuff up. You know, like we're, if we're not evolving then what are we doing? We're not getting better and learning more. What are what are we doing? So I love that. That's so great. Um, v, uh, what medium do you usually work in when you're doing your art? And also, who was your favorite character to draw? Uh, medium, I'm almost entirely digital from beginning to end. I do uh, the roughs, thumbnails um, in a tiny notebook, usually in bed, and then. I scan that in and from that point it's it's all digital um so i uh i normally do um painted backgrounds uh, and flat cartoony figures um like an animation cell or uh everything fiona staples has ever done um but this was like the second book i've ever done where i was just taking it from concept to inks and, and not doing the colors so it was a, like incredibly pleasantly surprising and astonishing uh, to see <laughs> like how the colors came out without my involvement it was incredible like the, the um i know i keep talking about the atmosphere but just the sense of atmosphere in this element of the creative process that i had nothing to do with really took them to the next level it was remarkable um i it's my favorite character to draw was it mm -hmm. careful they're all listening Oh no. Well, they all live in you, so I guess technically <laughs> they are. Sersha's hair a character? It's, it's it probably. <laughs> it, had, it has a presence on the page. I think it, it probably is Sersha. Um, so I, I did need to come up with a design for the main character that would be fun to draw, because she is on almost every page. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm having, a, having a blast doing all of that. Different bits at uh, different hair emotion formats. She puts out when she's surprised or angry. It's it's so beautiful. It's just I, I you're right though. It's it is sort of its own character, and I just I've always been fascinated with the way that hair is drawn because I've never been able to draw hair, and so when mm. people can just make it come to life on a page, I'm just I'm so enthralled, and I'm just like, how how did you do this? It's so beautiful. <laughs> and, and going back to what we spoke about before we were on camera, I mean, it's red hair. And obviously, yes. you know, not to make the Very mud heads important. of the world feel bad, but I mean, you know. No, no. I, I mean, I mean, look, it just it just does things. Redheads absolutely need more representation. Y'all only just got an emoji. <laughs> really? Really? Yeah. We finally, we're emoji worthy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, I'm I'm happy that we can also give representation to the redheads of the world. This makes me very happy. Um, and so I have one final question for the both of you. Do either of you believe in the Fae? And if so, what's your favorite type of Fae being? I, I mean, I guess in a weird way, it's kind of very like context related. Like you ask me now in like my, you know, antiseptic, antiseptic Toronto room it's like ah, oh, it doesn't feel very like fae ish but like um you know, i was mentioning my you know my dad was born in ireland so we've, we've traveled to ireland a few times as family 
And there are there are like castles or the right type of old drafty homes in like the countryside there where you start thinking maybe there is a banshee kind of hiding out there in the forest, which would I think be like one of my least favorite. I, I love banshees. I love that whole idea of the, of the wailing and the keening and sirens and people being lured to their death. I think there's just something like fascinating and romantic and creepy in it. So I'd be up with that. And the other one um, is I got you know, I, I to represent for leprechauns who have been horrifically, horrifically recast in modern society. They are actually, leprechauns are the son of Lou which is the sun god, the Irish sun god. So leprechauns were actually historically, well, historically fantasy speaking, were tall, beautiful. The reason they love gold is because gold is the representation of the sun on earth. So that's why it's not that this notion of greedy, they weren't making shoes and selling cereal or being in moderately entertaining, campy horror films. Like they are there, they are these tall, beautiful creatures, you know, descendants of the sun god. And so, uh, you know, I'm gonna we'll do a little reffing for the leprechaun. You you go, Leps. You go. All right. V, what about you? You know, it, I think I just I have the same opinion as Connor. Basically, you know, you you don't believe in ghosts until you are in a castle at midnight with all the lights out. I don't believe in the fae, but I have been in woods like at twilight, and there's a stone arch that goes nowhere, and I don't feel safe. So there's maybe, potentially. Um, it's my favorite type of play. I like the um, the slua, I think is how to pronounce it. I'm not sure, I'm sorry. Uh, which are like, as far as I remember, like a crowd of normal dead people, but bad and flying, that, that can come and, uh, come and drag you away through Whoa. open windows, if I remember. Yeah, there's, there's nothing like swarm, swarms of things. People like swarms of things. <laughs> I, I like how that was like a swarm of normal dead people. And then there was the twist. Like, yeah, <laughs> you live a much more exciting life than I do. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, this was amazing. Thank you both so much for your time today. Uh, it's been a joy chatting with you. And, you know, for those of you watching at home, please be sure to pick up a copy of The Last Witch Number One in stores now. <laughs>